So last week, uh, you probably noticed that we finished up a, a series called Love, Sex, and Dating, right? Was that impactful for anybody's life in the building? Um, really, really grateful to do that. And we were going to turn the chapter and start a new collection today. Um, but as I looked through the sermons, I realized that we talked a lot about courtship. We talked a lot about dating. We talked about sex a whole lot. Talked about marriage. But one thing that we didn't discuss with ample time was singleness. The singleness. And so what I want to do today is I want to park in this. I want to park and I want to talk about singleness and this blessed estate uh, that God um, honors and loves. And so although I don't profess to be an expert in this, um, I have been a pastor for about 15 years, uh, or I've been in ministry about 15 years, a lead pastor for the last five, and I would say that it's no exaggeration that I have li listened to, uh, encouraged, and exhorted countless singles, um, listening to that from single mothers and fathers, uh, to the divorced, to widowed, I've listened to stories and the joys and the opportunities, the challenges, laments, you name it. And I couldn't have written the sermon today uh, without listening to those countless stories. And ultimately, God bless you. And ultimately, I want to borrow liberally from one of the most famous singles of all time, who is Jesus and also the Apostle Paul. Is that all right today, church? And so let me, let me give you the historical backdrop, and then I'll let you know where we're going in the book today. Is that okay? So we're going to name this sermon Living Single because I'm from the 90s. You know what I'm saying? We are living Ooh, in the 90s. Kind of, no, 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 stop it. I wanted to see how holy y'all was. Y'all failed. F. No holiness in this house. Holiness is done. We're done. I'm glad I just can't be thrown out. Like, there has to be some. We're going to edit this for YouTube, too, so we won't be in there. Right? No, but seriously, once upon a time in America... There was this idea that, yo, you, after a certain age, you just go and get married. That was the norm. But since the Bureau of Labor and Statistics began tracking these numbers in the early 70s, what they found was startling recently, was that people are getting married less, and the number of singles now outnumbers the number of married people. Yeah. Now, this is shocking. This is, this is surprising because this is a, a shift in the cultural narrative and what's happening in society. And so with the boom of singleness and with the culture being very loud about what singleness is, I think it's time that we just park for a second and reorient our minds around what the Bible has to say about it. Yeah. Now, on one hand, I think there are some singles who are very content with their singleness, right? They, they believe, they want to be in this, they want to walk in it. But there's others of us who although we're, we wouldn't describe ourselves as content, we would say, yo, I'm hyper-focused on marriage. And so there's some who have an unhealthy obsession with marriage, and what that does is it doesn't allow you to be present in your current circumstances. And it also is dangerous because many people believe that once I get a spouse, I'm finally going to be complete. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Jerry. Ms. She heard it earlier, right? Like, once I get it. Right, you hear it all the time, don't we? We hear people say, oh, I'm looking for my true love. I'm looking for my soulmate. I'm looking for somebody to complete me. Let me just let you know something. I'm already a whole whole. Yeah. You are already a whole whole. Yeah. Somebody does not complete you. How do I know? Colossians 2, 10 and 11. This is what it says. In him you have been made, what does that word say? Complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. What this means is if you are looking for somebody to complete you, you have overlooked what, what Jesus has already done in your life. You've overlooked it. Because spouses don't complete you. Spouses complement you. Right? If you think about Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam, Eve was not created because there was something lacking in Adam. In fact, Adam had to lose something, his rib, in order to get Eve. And so what I'm trying to communicate is, is that oftentimes we're looking for a marriage to achieve something it does not achieve. It does not, it does not uh, cover up your brokenness. What it actually do is magnify your brokenness. So whoever single you is, married you is going to be that on 10 times because it exposes your area, exposes who you are. Now, here's the thing. Not only that, but I think some of us really have a, a skewed view 
of what marriage is. Skew view, right? In the words of John Tyson, one of the reasons that we're obsessed with marriage is because we have a modern view of romance, a modern view of romance. You know, this whole notion of two people falling helplessly in love, right? You've seen it on every movie, right? Every single movie, they fall helplessly in love. They run away and elope and all, the, and all these things. Let me just tell you, that is very, very individualistic. And that is historically not how marriage has worked in ancient times or in the scriptures. What would happen is that marriage is not just the uniting of two people. It was considered the uniting of two families. Two families coming together, not just, not just two uh, individuals. So many singles idolize marriage and treat it as the ultimate goal. And many marrieds are stuck searching for the idealize of marriage that they idolized. Does that make sense, church? Let's just be honest. We don't make it easy in the church, do we? Because we have what I would like to describe as marriage-centric churches. Or I wrote this initially, marriage-centric marriage, marriage, cent, marriage centric church circus. That's what I like to describe, right? And in these circles, it can make singles feel like they are second-class citizens. Because in our churches, marital culture is dominant, is it not? You think about it, all the events, all the activities, all the formal messages, all the curriculum is normally geared at couples and families with little application to singles. And then my singles will let you know that, you know, marrieds have a way of making social circumstances or social settings very, very awkward yeah. when they play matchmaker. Yeah. Matchmaker all the time. Yeah. Just gets rough sometimes. <laughs> and because of this, and because of this, it causes a real problem in our churches. Because think about it for a second. Like early on in your, early on in your singleness is really, really not as challenging. It may be challenging, but it's not as challenging. Primarily because, well, all your friends are single. Everybody's either coming out of college or coming out of trade school. They're entering into their adult years. They're pretty much single. Unless you went to Bible college and got married at 19. That's the, that's the, that's the caveat. But singles, right? So, but, but, but as things progress, as your friends get married, as your friend is on her second and third baby at this point, and as they're buying houses, what singles and marrieds often do is they look at the single as, they, as if there's something wrong with them, and they look at their situation through the lens of loss. They feel sorry for them, like something is wrong with them, because God robbed them of the very best thing, which is marriage. Does that make sense, singles? Like they feel like, like, like God, marriage is good for me. I don't have it. I feel like I'm losing out on it. And then the marrieds are looking at them funny because they feel like they have a relational deficit. But let me just tell you, the married couple that looks at the single as deficit and the single that feels that they've been robbed of a marriage have a very poor and unbiblical view of singleness. Because Jesus and the Apostle Paul provide an alternative for our singles today that I want to talk about. Is that all right today, church? Now, listen, I'm going to just give you a warning. I'm going to be all over this Bible today. Somebody say all over the Bible. All over the Bible. Genesis to 1 Corinthians. I'm going to be all in it, all right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my roadmap, and then I'm going to get to it. Number one, I want to show you the origin of singleness. The origin of singleness. Then I want to give you the different types of singles. I want to talk about the <coughs> advantages <coughs> and challenges of singleness. And if I get to it, which I think I will, I want to give some encouragement to our singles. Yeah. All right? So I'm going to go to the origin of singleness, the different type of singles, the advantage and challenges of singleness. And then I want to give some encouragement to our singles. So I'm going to be all over the Bible. Let's start in Genesis, shall we? Is that cool? Y'all yeah. know quiet day. It's all good. Here we go. Let's start in Genesis. Now, too often when we look at the opening chapters of Genesis, right, we see in chapter 1 that there's the creation of the heaven and earth. God creates everything in six days, including man and woman. And then he rests on the Sabbath day or the seventh day. But too often we look at the narrative in Genesis through the lens, of, through a marital lens. Like, we, that's how we look at it. We look at it, but prior to Eve being created, Adam was a single man. We don't know how long that was between the time that Adam, between the time Adam was created and Eve was created, but we do know that there was a time in his life where he was a single man. Yeah. 
And he was exercising his authority and walking in his purpose under the authority of Christ the creator. Does that make sense? Right? That's different because we normally look at Adam and Eve as a marital pair, but we see that marriage doesn't show up until later. Adam was created, and he's walking around the earth by himself autonomous. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And so what we see, we have got three quick observations. Number one, we find out that Adam is made in the image of God. Yeah. He's made in the image of God. What this means is that men and women both possess a divine stamp from God. We bear his likeness, we're made in his image, we have giftings that are very, very similar to God, like that's what it is. So this means that our identity, who we are as a person, is first and foremost rooted in our relationship with God. Does that make sense? So your relationship for who you are is rooted in who God has made you to be. Now this is important because it means that Adam was not chiefly defined by his relationship to his bride, but he was chiefly, he was chiefly, uh, he was chiefly defined by his relationship to God first. And that's important because a lot of us define ourselves by the relationships that we're in and not the ultimate relationship with God, right? He never define, he doesn't define himself like, like, like you are more than who you are with. You're more than like, like singles, let me get this. You are not defined. This is important. You are not defined by your absence of marriage. Your life does not begin when your name is hyphenated or you take your spouse's name or she takes yours or you just have a marriage certificate. It doesn't begin that way. You are valued because you are created in the image of God. And then when sin has destroyed your life, you were remade in the second Adam who is Christ. Does that make sense, church? So what I'm trying to communicate is, is that that is how you have to define yourself. Stop defining yourself as you, from a relational standpoint and start defining yourself as a child, a son, or daughter of God. Does that make sense, church? Here, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. He was maximizing, Adam was maximizing his season. <laughs> I love this. When God creates Adam... Out of the dust of the ground, Bill breathes his nostrils, the breath of life into him. Adam comes alive, and then the first thing that he does is he gives him a responsibility. He says, I want you to not only subdue the earth, but I want you to go name the animals. I don't know if you know, but there are 8.7 million species of animals on the earth. Uh, theologians don't know if he named a group of animals, if he named every animal, but here's what I do know, is that before Eve was created, Adam not only had a divine relationship with God, but he was walking in his purpose. He was walking in his purpose. He was using all of his cognitive, intellectual capabilities and naming all the animals. What I'm saying is I feel like a lot of us are missing out in this season especially in singles, we're so preoccupied with marriages that we're not maximizing where we are right now. Don't you know that you've been endowed with gifts? Don't you know that you have responsibilities? Or, or, or they say on TikTok, responsibilities? You have gifting, you have calling, you have intellect, you have abilities, and God wants you to mobilize them, not be so preoccupied with a marriage. Are y'all hearing me? And so here's the next thing he does. Adam follows divine instruction. So he, number one, he's made in the image of God. Number two, he, he has responsibilities, but he also follows the image of God. He says, God says to him, I don't want you to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because in the day you eat of it, you will perish. He was like, I want you to go and subdue the earth, but I'm only putting this tree here to let you know that you do not define morality. I do. And to remind you that you are not in authority, I am. And I don't know if you know, but I looked this up, and there are 60,000 species of trees out there. And so what he's saying is that I want you to enjoy either the fruit or the shade of 59,999 other trees. So what God is saying to Adam is, I don't want you to fixate on this tree that you can't have its fruit. I want you to go and enjoy the breath of the fruit and the shade that you can enjoy from these other trees. What does that have to do with my singles? Stop fixating on the one thing you don't have and appreciate and maximize the myriad of things that you do have. You got a lot in your hand. 
So he goes on, like he's, he's commanding, he's saying to him, I want you to go enjoy the earth. I want you to go subdue it and take authority over it. Don't fixate on this one thing because even though it's beautiful on the outside, you don't know the type of fruit that's on the inside. And a lot of us have fixated on the fruit of marriage. But let me just tell you, if you're not careful, you will bite into it and find out that this fruit is rotten. Or you will find out that this fruit is plastic. It's just, it just looks good, but ultimately it's falling apart on the inside. Let me just go on here. Let me go on here. So we told you a little bit about the origin of singles. I did that in, oh God, did it eight minutes. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about the type of singles. Why don't you join me in Matthew 19? Matthew 19. I'm going to start, I'm going to start at verse, verse four, right? Verse four. This is Jesus talking about divorce and marriage. I want to talk about how it applies to us. Have you read, he replied, that he has created them in the beginning and made them man or male and female? So right there, he's defining gender as, non, as, as binary. That's what's happening, right? And he also says, for this reason, man will leave his father and mother and be joined together in his wife. The two will become one flesh so that the, no, the two are no longer one, they're, they're no longer, but they're one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Verse 7, why then, they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers? Remember, in Deuteronomy, we talked about this a little bit last week about uh, divorce and its legislation. We said that it was, a, it was pointing to De, uh, Deuteronomy 24. Uh, divorce was legislated by God because people were getting married, and in order to break the marriage, the men were somehow killing the women. It was a really, really nasty situation. And so what, Jesus, what God said was, you know what? I want to bring this back to the ideal, which is Adam and Eve, pre-sin in the garden, but I can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some laws in place in order to protect vulnerable women now while I deal with your biggest issue, which is sin. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so he says in verse 8, he says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts, but it was not intended that from the beginning. Verse 9, I tell you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, again, this, is, this word sexual immorality is the word pornea. It ex, it's a wide range of sexual sins, right? So we know that the case for divorce, according to this, is sexual immorality as well as desertion from 1 Corinthians 7 and a myriad of things that look like that. So emotional abuse, sexual assault, all those type of things are grounds for a divorce. But God did not intend it from the beginning, but it happened because of sin. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. So he goes on. He says, sexual morality. His disciples say, if this is the relationship between a man and a woman and his wife, it is better not to marry. Yeah. So they're like, nah, we should be able to divorce for whatever. But this is what Jesus says. Coming down to verse 11, he said, not everyone can accept this, but the one to those to whom it has been given. Okay. So he, and, and he drops down, he says, you need to be able to accept this. But what he does here in verse 12 is he talks about three different types of singles. And he looks at this through the lens by calling them eunuchs. We're going to walk through this real quick, okay? Is that enough background for us? <laughs> okay, okay. So he jumps in, right? Let me give you context, just for context sake. There were two schools of thought regarding divorce during this time. There was one school of thought that said, oh, no, you can just put your wife away for anything. Like, if she doesn't please you anymore, you can just leave her aside. There was another group that said, no, 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 if, oh, it has to be specific and significant reasons. So what they decided to do was take these reasons to Jesus, expecting that Jesus was going to give them an answer. And Jesus said, no, 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 I'm not just going to talk about the context of this situation. I'm actually going to take you back to the book of Genesis and tell you how this existed from the beginning. Right? And so he gets down. And he says, no, I need you to just accept this. I know that this is a hard teaching, but you need to accept it. And then in verse 12, he lays out the three types of Christian singles, and he employs this word eunuch. Now, the eunuch can refer to someone who does not have the reproductive organs to produce, but it can also describe celibate singles. So let's, let's start with the first group, all right? You with me? Let's start with the first group. So he said there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, right? So what he has in view here is people that either cannot or will not pursue a sexual relationship. So maybe this is because they're unable to do so. Maybe it's because they're intersex and they have both reproductive organs. Maybe it's because they're same-sex attracted. 
and they know that that's incongruent with the sexual ethics of Scripture. Nevertheless, Jesus is suggesting that um, he's suggesting that this is them pursuing lifelong celibacy. And don't worry, we're going to talk about our LGBTQ stuff in our You Ask For It series. Don't worry. That weed and it being a, Christianity being a white man's religion because that's what y'all ask for. That's what people want to know. They want to know about weed. That's what, <laughs> that's what they want to know. Like we need another intoxicant, okay? Like we need one. But anyway, let me go on here. Let me go. So, so then he mentions lifelong celibates, right? So when we, now when we think about lifelong celibacy, right, let's just pause here for a second. I like how Chandler explains this. He said, many of us think of this weary life, this really, really sad life where, oh, I'm a Christian celibate and I'm just going back to my apartment and it's dark and dingy in here. And I'm just going to eat some cold Chinese food by myself, right? I'm so sad and miserable. This is like an ancient trope. But he points out, right, there's this, there's this same sex-attracted celibate. This is what he says. His name is Don Maddenly. Don Madison. He says, my life is not a life of misery. I am not doomed to celibacy or a life of heartbreaking loneliness. I reject the representation of life starving for celibacy as miserable. And part of my mission in life is to debunk all the drudgery, droopy tropes out there about what celibacy is really about. Does that make sense? And then Ron Ballou, an international speaker who's also a same-sex attracted, but he's celibate. This is what he says. He says, is celibacy difficult? Yes. He says, so is marriage. And so is grad school. Life is pain, princess. He got that from some movie. He said, is it frustrating at times? Yes. But have you ever watched somebody raising a toddler? Because sometimes that's difficult as well. And having been there, having there, having, haven't there been times where I wanted to give up? Yes. But is it worth it? Yes. Do I regret it? No. So what I want to do there is I'm just pushing back against this unfounded idea of what celibacy is, like it's some weird, dreary, sad experience. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, here we go. All right, so we, got, we have that. We have the celibates made that way by man, right? This is the group that they would call the eunuchs. Um, they were castrated because of cultic practices or because of political interests. And then you have the last group that I think describes many of us, which is the dedicated celibates. The dedicated celibates are where I believe most people fall. These are people who want to have families but, and have sexual desires, but they know that that's supposed to be expressed in the context of a life-giving marriage. Yeah. So what they do is they hold off on those and they allow their gospel testimony to be their greatest witness. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so this can include divorcees, widows, and waiting, and hopefully they're, 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 they're hopeful that one day they'll have a spouse, but until that day happens, they're going to live in this way as a celibate single for the kingdom of God. Now, now, that was a lot, but this is why I'm telling you this, because what Jesus mentions the eunuchs here in this scripture, it is absolutely fundamentally revolutionary, because think of the Jewish view of blessing during this time. They said how you were blessed, how you experienced the blessing of God is a fewfold. Number one, you get married. Then after you get married, you follow the law. And then as you're following the law, you have children. And when you have children, you eventually have land, and that's how you experience the blessing of God. But Jesus comes along, and he opens up a new relational category. He's saying, no, 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 no. That, that was one way, but I want to tell you of a new way. And this new way is, is through the proclamation of the gospel. Yeah. And when you proclaim the gospel and people become saved, what happens is you're not procreating, but you're having spiritual children who are filling up the earth with the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he's saying, he's saying that procreation and marriage are not the way that you experience the blessing of God. How you experience the blessing of God is by meeting his son Jesus, having your life transformed, and sharing the gospel so that we can have other spiritual children whose lives are transformed by the very same thing. So what he's doing is he's opening up new categories. So he's saying, this is transformational. He's saying you don't have to look at your singleness through the lens of loss because Jesus says that it's not loss, it's actually gain. It's actually something that could change your life, all right? So we talked about the origin of singleness, all right, the types of singleness. Now let's discuss the advantages and disadvantages of singleness. Is that all right, church? 
I got 10 minutes. We're going to fly through this. 1 Corinthians 7, you knew where I was going. I got five observations I want to make about singleness. Here's the first one. Are you ready? Number one, singleness is no better or worse than marriage. Singleness is no better or worse than marriage. Look what Paul says in chapter 7, verse 7. He said, I wish that all were as I am, single, but each has his own gift from God. One, one kind, which is singleness, and another, another kind, which is marriage, right? You see that? So what he's saying is both gifts are affirmed, both are called gifts, and they display the beauty of God in various ways. So he's saying that marriages display the beauty of God because they show the depth of his love, right? What you're doing is you're focusing on one, or, one person. I was about to say one or two people, Jesus. Uh, but you're focusing on one partner. For the rest of your life, you're probably more than like your family, and you're loving them with the, with the depth of God. You're loving them in a committed relationship. He's saying singles are different because they can display the breath of God's love. They can show affection and love platonically over to a larger group of people. So whereas marriage shows off the love that Christ has for the church, singleness shows off how the church has love for Christ and its singular devotion and seeing the kingdom of God expanded. So you see what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is it's one side of a coin. One is not better than the other, right? I told you this, number two, singleness is a gift. This is what Paul describes it as. It doesn't mean that the circumstances that led to your singleness is a gift, it means that the current condition that you're in, that singleness in and of itself is a gift. It doesn't mean that, um, that oh, it's only a select group of people that had this. No, no. He's saying your relational status that you have is good, is a gift, and is good because God is good. Does that make sense? And so number three, let me give it to you. Number three, singleness is at times preferred over marriage. Singleness, let me show you verse 26. He says, because of this present distress... I think it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, some of y'all might wonder, well, what is the present distress? Right now, he's, in, he's, he's going through persecution. And persecution is when you are being ostracized and, and suffering for your faith. It's not something we're really going through right now in America. Like, I mean, the masks are a little annoying, but other than that, like, we're not going through any persecution right now. And so what's happening is... He's saying, listen, because of the time of persecution, it's probably better that you remain single. Because I can imagine that it is difficult to go through, it is very difficult to go through persecution as a single. But when you have the responsibility of a whole family, a husband, a wife, kids, all that, then it's even more difficult. So he's saying, like, I think it's better that you remain as you are. Because during this time, people are getting sold, families are getting breaking up. It's going to cause a lot of distress. But I also think that it gives us a principle that certain times it is advantageous for you to wait for marriage. Like, I know that some of us are in a hurry to get married. We want to do all those things. But there are times when singleness is the best thing for your life, right? When you're trying to develop your career, sometimes singleness is the best thing that can happen. When you're trying to grow in your gifting, singleness is the best time, thing that can happen. If you just jump out of an unhealthy relationship long-term, singleness is an opportunity for you to get healing from that brokenness. Does that make sense? And so there are times where it's a gift. Let me give you number four. Let me give you number four. This is a funny one. Singleness spares you from the troubles of marriage. Let me go ahead and I know some of y'all would laugh at that. I got, I got Bible, though. Let me give you some Bible, okay? You ready? This is the Apostle Paul, not me. Verse, tw verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you released from a wife? Do not seek a wife. However, if you get married, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But such people, get this, will have what? Oh, it ain't up there? Don't worry. I'll read it for you. I'll read it for you. Such people, I th almost like Paul is saying, you people. He's saying, you people will have trouble in this life, and I am trying to spare you. It doesn't seem like he has a high view of marriage, but he does. He has a high view of marriage, and he also has a high view of, of, of singleness. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Marriage is great. It's fantastic, wonderful. It's a great institution. Um, however, that, me that, doesn't mean, that does not mean that it does not come with its issues. And all the marriage people will say, oh, yeah, amen, that's true. 
Marriage is combustible. Why would you think it's not? Because there's two different people from two different families, different emotional language, idiosyncrasies, perspectives, habits, goals, anxieties, and fear, all living in the same house together. And then on top of that, psychiatrists tell us that they change every few years. So the person that you marry or you said I do to is often a different person year four. And so what do you think that's going to create? It's going to create a combustible environment. And I haven't even mentioned in-laws yet. I haven't even talked about money. I have not talked about the honey-do list. I have not talked about kids. I have not even mentioned the, the temperature in your house. <laughs> Married people know that that is a fight, right? I try to tell Sarah, like, yo, can you not touch the thermostat? She said, I'll do whatever I want. This is my house. I'm like, well, can you put some clothes on first? Can you put, like, put a hoodie on? No, not my hoodie. It's a hoodie. <laughs> but I'm just trying to tell you, some of y'all think that marriage is, is all wonderful. My life is going to be complete. I'm going to be so happy. I don't know about that. Some of y'all might need a longer, a longer season of singleness to work on your selfishness. You don't know how selfish you are until you are married to somebody else and you got to share your money. Or you can't do on the day, your, your day off, you can't do what you want to do. That's why Ephesians 5 talks about husband having to die daily. Not in a bad sense. He's saying die to their desires so that their wife, who is the bride of Christ, analogously, can live. You see what I'm saying? So Paul is saying, go ahead out there and get married if you want. It's cool. You haven't sinned, but you're about to have some trouble in your life. Some good trouble and some bad trouble, all right? <laughs> okay. All right. That's in the Bible. Somebody say it's in the Bible. It's in the text. It's in the text. I'm in the text. All right. <laughs> Number five. Here it is. I got three minutes. Marriage is a passing reality. Marriage is a passing reality. He says here <clears throat> in verse 29, I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to read it to you I'm just because I need to go through it. But what he's saying is, he's saying marriage is not eternal. It's a picture of the relationship that God has with his church. And so if you're in a bad marriage, that's good news to you. If you're in a good marriage, you're going to have a greater one with Jesus in heaven, a non-sexual one naturally. Right? But what he's saying is that we're going to have joy and intimacy. Like some of us are so focused on the temporal marriage now that we're missing out on the joy that we're going to have in the eternal one later. He's saying don't be so focused on that, right? I remember I was on a plane one time coming from L.A. to um, Philly. And the, the pilot was like, hey, uh, if you look out your left side of the plane now, you'll see the Grand Canyon. And it was nice. You know, it was nice. But you know what it was? It was a passing view. It wasn't something, the view did not last the duration of the trip or the whole duration of the trip. And what he's saying is that marriage is very similar. It's a blessed institution, but it's not going to last forever. You're not going to be given to in, marry anybody in heaven. Yeah. And he's saying that this is a beautiful thing. Let me give you number six. You ready? Number six. Singleness frees you from being preoccupied with marriage. Some of the anxiety that some of us have, is because we're too preoccupied with our, with our marriage in the state of singleness. We're, married, we're, we're wondering, right? But this is what's happening. Married people, right? We're, we're, it's not to say that singles' attention is not divided, but in a different way. Married people are really focused on a very, very few things. Our time, effort, energy is divided, is divided among a few things. So instead of putting energy into a number of people and a number of different objectives, we put it into a few people. So as a married man, I'm concerned with, I mean, is, does my wife still like me, right? Because we're planning a church and it's hard sometimes. I, I have to ask that question. Like, I know you love me and you're not going to leave me, but do you like me? Like, am I a good person? Do you like me, right? How are my kids doing? Are they becoming disciples of Christ? Or are they been discipled in a system that tells them that achievement is the way to make it in this land, right? Are they becoming followers of Jesus? How am I doing at my church, right? Like, I'm worried about all these things. My, my focus shrinks down to a few people. Now, this does not mean, get this, that singles have more time. And it does not mean that singles have more money, right? But because they actually have to work harder for their relationships. When married people come home, ideally, they're coming home and having a meaning, meaningful conversation with their spouse. Singles, in order for them to have meaningful conversation, oftentimes, they have to go and pursue those efforts. But that in and of itself is the gift, 
because they're able to give themselves more broadly even though they don't have as much time and money because they're doing so. Does that make sense, church? And so what he's saying, what he's saying is like, like singleness has its gift and marriage is a gift, but each of them come with complexities and challenges and neither of them should be idolized. Because they're showing off two different things. Now, here's, here's some of the struggles of singleness, and I'm, and I'm finishing up the band can come. Here's some of the struggles. Number one, I'd say the biggest struggle for singles is sexual temptation. Not that that's the whole, but, and not that they have a unique challenges, but I'll tell you why. Because we have bought into the lie that in order to be fully alive, you must have sexual expression and sexual experience. So Matt Chandler says. It says, in order for you to be fully alive now, You have to have sex. And I just want to tell you that that is not a Christian worldview. That is a worldview of Sigmund Freud. You are alive as you can be right now because you are fulfilled and complete in Jesus. Now, it's not, now, now, some of us are like, but I got these sexual urges. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with sexual urges, but the reason that they're so strong is because you won't starve them. You won't starve them. You looking at booty popping videos online. You looking at dudes with chisel six packs and oil all over their body because they just finished working out. Like, no wonder your lust is through the roof right now. It's because you are feeding your body the wrong thing. You want a spiritual six pack, but you looking at some dude whose hairline is right next to his eyebrows, tall, dark, and handsome, showing off his little cut, wearing them tight jeans. Let me not even, not, let me not even go down. Let me, let me not go. Let me not. He got on sweatpants online. You up there looking and lusting after him. What do you think is going to happen? What did you think? Your flesh is the unredeemed aspect of you that wants to be antithetical to God. I know that you like you saved and you walking with Jesus. Uh Uh-huh, I know that. But you still have that sarks, Paul calls it, that part of your body that wants to desert and run away Jesus and fulfill your flesh. And so what happens is, is a lot of us are just feeding ourselves the wrong thing. And then we're wondering on top of that why we, like, ooh, why am I so hot right now? Well, it's because you're watching, you're watching twerk, twerk videos. It's because you're watching, you know, you on the little fitness channel looking at all the women and looking at all the dudes. That's why you're so hot right now. You better hit unfollow, unlike, unsubscribe, get in your Bible, and stop with the shenanigans. You can play. You can play because I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on going here. Yeah, your sexual, ur- sexual urges are a good thing. They're a beautiful thing, right? But even when you do have sex, it still does not cause it to be quenched because ultimately the sexual desire points to a desire to be known by Jesus. That's what it does. So I just want to encourage my singles. Like, I know, I know that's tough, and I know that loneliness is a real thing. Some of y'all are lonely right now. But let me just tell you something. Loneliness is a part of the human condition. I'm less concerned with people being lonely and more concerned with them being isolated. Because when you're lonely, that happens. But isolated is when you choose to cut yourself off from people. And married people will tell you that just because you lay in the bed with somebody every night, it doesn't mean that you're not still lonely. Doesn't mean that. So I'm just trying to help somebody. Let, let, me, let me just give you some quick, quick guidelines, okay? Number one, I want to encourage you to make sure you're pursuing your marriage with God. I mean, pursuing your relationship with God more than your marriage or your desire for your marriage for my singles. Like I find that some, some of us are too preoccupied. If you find yourself, this is, I'm going to give you an old, old help. If you find yourself too preoccupied with marriage, you need to fast. You need to fast. You need to let go of something physical, which is food that we all love. And you need to grasp something spiritual from God, which is satisfaction in your current estate. If you're too preoccupied with it, Because when you are, Satan loves it because you are being distracted from accomplishing the mission that God has for you. Number, number, the last thing I'll say is, don't think that God has withheld any good thing from you. He hasn't withheld it. I I love my kids. I know that's a marriage-centric example, but I'm going to go with it anyway. Single people have kids too, right? Amen. And so I looked at my son the other day because my daughter was away, and I said, son, I love you. Look at you. I grab him by the face and, like, just kiss him. He hates it. He hates it. I say, part of the reason, son, that you're on this earth 
is be affectionate to your dad. You don't have to be affectionate to anybody else, maybe your mom. But to me, I need hugs and kisses. I'm not tolerating it. And I said, son, I love you. And he like sighed like, oh, I know, I know dad. But he doesn't really know. Because he doesn't know that I would give my life for him. He doesn't know that if there was a train coming and he was in a way, I'd push him out of the way and get ran over by the train. He doesn't know that if he was in the hospital and he was sick and I could exchange my life for his so he could enjoy a new life, I would do it in an instant. He doesn't know the depth and breadth of love that I have for him. And I think if I love my son that much and my kids and you love your kids that much, how much more do you think that God loves you? How much more? How much more do you think he loves you? For me, those are all hypothetical situations. But Jesus didn't live in the hypotheticals. He wasn't obligated to leave heaven. He wasn't obligated to come down earth. And let me just tell you, Jesus was less of a victim and he was more of a volunteer. He said, I'm going to volunteer to take the punishment that they deserve. Because God the Father just couldn't sweep your sin under the rug, otherwise he wouldn't be holy. He had to deal with it because he's a just God. Because your works of righteousness and the good things you do are not enough to bridge your relationship with God. So Jesus realized that, and he says, I'll go take the punishment. And I'll die a heinous, nasty condition. And I'll forgive them and accept them before they even know me. And God has given us the greatest gift which is salvation in Christ. And let me just tell you, I love it. I love, I love to talk about it. One of the reasons that I don't choose any other religious form is because, or religious expression, is because those are all about what I can do for God. They're all about how I can please Him. They're all about me working in my own ability, and then I don't even really know if I am. But in Jesus, I know that I'm accepted. I'm already loved. I'm already chosen. I'm already accepted by him. God doesn't simply love me for me. He loves me and he loves what my savior and my big brother has done on my behalf. And if he wouldn't withhold this son and gave us his good gift, you don't have to think that he's withholding a marriage from you. So my single, let me just tell you, go ahead and do what God has called you to do. Maximize this season. Fast and pray so you're not so preoccupied with a marriage. And believe that God is going to give you the desires of your heart while you pursue it. While you pursue it. So I just want to take some time. I'm done. Seven minutes over. I'm going to pray for you. I want to pray for anybody in here that. Why don't you bow your head and close your eyes? If you are single in here right now and you just, you, all of you don't have to do this, but if you just really, really need God to do something in your heart because you have been obsessing over marriage. I just want you to open up your heart right now. Just tell the Lord, Lord, I, I'm obsessing over this thing. You don't have to raise your hand. Just let him know right now. God, I've been obsessing. God, I want to be married so bad that oftentimes it clouds my judgment. Just go ahead and let him know. And maybe if you're married in here, maybe you've been idolizing your marriage and thinking that your marriage was supposed to satisfy you. It never was. And you're putting too many hard restrictions on your spouse. That's one relationship. Father, I just come right now just praying for my marriage and singles. Right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just sense that there's some singles in here. Some are very, very content in this season. Some are maximizing their purpose and they're joyfully waiting for you to open up a door for a spouse. Or they're committed to lifelong celibacy. Lord, I pray that you will bless them. I pray that you will continue to give them strength and encouragement. To let them know that their labor is not in vain. And that they don't need sexual fulfillment in order to be full and complete people because that's already done in Jesus. But Lord, I pray for those who have an unhealthy obsession about marriage right now. Those who feel that you are just far away and they, they, they just, they believe that marriage is a gift but they wish that they could exchange it for something else. Father, I pray right now that you would give them a deep sense of contentment in this season. That you would encourage their hearts to let them know that this is a blessed estate as they wait for you to open up a door for them to be married. And so, Lord, I pray and ask you that you would encourage them. Lord, I thank you for them. And I pray that you will bless them with the spouse. I pray you bless them 
with the person that desires of their heart. Lord, don't just give them what they need or give them what they want. Lord, give them what they need in this season. Somebody to compliment them and, and strengthen them. Somebody, Lord, with a good credit score. Hallelujah. Lord, that's working on, that's snowballing a debt, that's going, that's mentally healthy. Lord, that's not afraid to shoot their shot and be rejected, that serve Jesus. Lord, that got a prayer life, that won't, that won't try to have sexual advances to them. Lord, bless them with, with what they're looking for, God. Satisfy them, oh God. You know they got a type, Lord, that they love. I'm asking you, Lord, bless them with their type, whoever that is. <laughs> Give it to them, Lord. Uh, but, but help them be healthy on the way. Don't let them get into sexual temptation while they're doing it, Jesus. Help them, help them, Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that you will bless them. And while your eyes are closed, while your head's bowed, I just want to, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, I just want to offer this invitation to you. If there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, you can just extend your hand. We want to welcome you into the family of God. If there's anybody here. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Everybody that agree with that, say amen. 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 Come on, were you encouraged today?